Uh, again, um, it's great to be here. Uh, I've given talks on a variety of things at Montana Tech over the years, uh, I guess because I work on a variety of things. Not sure what I work on any longer. But uh, what I, what's that? Six mile. Yeah, the six mile creek, yes. <laughs> Colleen's got, she's here to pressure me. Um, <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, I, uh, Montana Western, for those who don't know, is uh, we're actually the first and only public university in the history of the United States that uses block scheduling, where students take one class at a time for a month. And uh, I was the great Satan of this whole thing. Um, I survived it, and nobody and Dylan lynched me. Um, and now they all think it was their idea. So that's good. Uh, that uh, <laughs> it seems to be going well. So what we do with it is we get students out and work on projects. And so what I'll present today is actually work conducted by a group of uh, students in an environmental field studies class uh, that's under my direction. But they did the work, so they deserve the credit. Uh, they um, put together, as a result of their work, uh, a report that goes to the agencies that we work for, um, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks primarily, uh, yeah, the uh, Beaverhead um, Watershed uh, Group, and uh, to some degree the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, over the years as well. And they put together these reports, and the reports um, are uh, there for these agencies to use for management uh, decisions going forward and uh, and then the students actually for their final exam uh, they go in and they do a PowerPoint presentation they have to defend the recommendations that they've made based on the data that they've gathered with these agencies and uh, this was a humdinger this year because we found some really important data that, about their management that requires change in their management and so they really hammered the students. It went on for about three hours. And uh, they did great um, and made their case. And uh, the management, uh, the agencies will be making some changes as a result. So anyway, I'll pass these around. Selene, I'll start with you. Um, one of those is a baseline study for Poindexter Slough. And the one is from 2017. Uh, I don't have the 2018 one yet printed, so uh, I'm not there yet, but we'll get there soon enough. All right, so Poindexter Slough, uh, if you all can see that, um, I'm assuming this red button is a pointer, yep. All right, so Poindexter Slough is a old channel that was part, it, that's, it's, a, an, a, it's a relic channel of the Beaverhead River, um, and uh, it, so, as a result, the water that goes into it um, today comes off of the Beaverhead River right here at a head gate, and then it re-enters the Beaverhead River down here. And the channel itself being cut by the Beaverhead River is larger than the amount of water that's put into Point Dexter Slough uh, at that head gate. And the reason for that is because Point Extra Slough is there to irrigate fields, not uh, to be a river um, and a fisheries. Uh, that was its purpose, um, was for irrigation. And so um, it, over the 4.73 mile length of Point Extra Slough, uh, it could hold 500 CFS uh, in that channel. That's Bank full. So at bank full, you could put 500 cubic feet per second down that channel, but it runs typically around 50 cubic feet per second um, at the head gate, and then it picks up accreted flows as it goes down through the system, primarily from groundwater recharge from agricultural areas adjacent to the slough. Uh, and natural springs, it picks up an additional 25. So it's typically running anywhere between 50 and 80 max CFS in Poindexter. So it, this is important information. It's dramatically less water than the Beaverhead River, and yet it has a channel that was built by the Beaverhead River and was that size. Everybody with me? 
All right. And I emphasize was, because um, this is what was changed on this. All right. Uh, it's been, we've calculated that habitat maintenance flows should be around 200 cubic feet per second in Poindexter Slough. Um, just meaning that you don't have to have the thing running at 500 cubic feet per second for it to function normally as a stream of this type and this gradient. Um, you can get away with about 200 CFS and it should function normally, meaning not fill up with sediment uh, and anomalously grow vegetation. Um, but over time, uh, it's actually been declining in flows because these accreted flows uh, that come into the system, they've decreased over time as a result of pivot irrigation, the switch over to pivot irrigation from uh, flood irrigation. Question? Uh, do you want questions now or sure. at the end? Uh, what caused the, the channel to change uh, yeah. from the slough to the present channel? Yeah. Uh, it evolved, um, the channel evolved or jumped uh, into a, a new pattern and uh, abandoned that channel. And uh, so that channel was actually on maps that Lewis and Clark made when they went through the valley. Um, and it probably was swampy, uh, filled with mostly groundwater, um, and maybe, you know, had some flow. Uh, but uh, it, um, a head gate was put on it a long time ago. That head gate is over 100 years, the old head gate was over 100 years old. And so water was diverted into it to irrigate that particular part of the valley over here because they had the channel and uh, there was a nice cut bank loop right there on the beaver head so they just put in a gate to divert the water. Make sense? All right, so when they made this switch over from uh, flood irrigation to pivots, which everyone has done, uh, that really reduced the amount of water recharge that goes back into the system um, because there's a lot of evaporation with pivots, right? And uh, not that there isn't with flood irrigation as well, but you are putting a fair amount of water back into the ground with flood irrigation. So we've seen declining flows as this transition to pivot irrigation has occurred. And as a result, corresponding to that, we've seen habitat degradation going on with those declining flows. All right, so by 2014, no pun intended, yes, pun intended, there was a slew of problems um, <laughs> on Poindexter. Poindexter, if you don't know, is an internationally renowned fly fishing destination. I myself have fished it for 25 plus years and uh, have run into people from France and Germany and you know all over uh, uh, the world uh, that come to this place to fish this um, spot. So it's extremely well known, or was, uh, and it was primarily because it had incredibly high fish numbers per mile. I think that at its peak, it was running close to 4,000 fish per mile uh, in Poindexter Slough, which is an incredibly large number. Um, and size ranges were typically upwards of 20 inches on average. So, uh, and these are mostly browns, um, a small percentage of rainbows, but they're mostly brown trout. So that's the very robust fisheries. Um, and it had been declining, and it had been documented that it had been declining by the people at Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and Dillon. Um, that uh, they'd seen uh, declining fish numbers and fish size. I think fish numbers had dropped to about uh, 1,200 fish per mile, uh, 1,000 fish per mile, and average sizes had dropped down to about 13 uh, inches by uh, the uh, about the decade, you know, over this last decade or so. So by 2014, those were the numbers where we were sitting. So uh, they were in decline, and lo and behold, angler use was in decline as well on Poindexter. And in real terms, it just wasn't a fun place to be, um, aside from the fact that the, there are data that show that the fish were declining in number and size, the environment had silted up so badly and had been vegetated up so badly that it was very hard to fish it, uh, frankly, because it was 
shallow and weedy and the muck that you had to walk through would suck your boots right off your feet if you know you were uh, didn't have a them tied well to your legs and and it stunk very badly of sulfur um, so there was hypoxia and anoxia going on in the pore water in the sediment so it was a mess and it just wasn't fun to be out there and people stayed away all right so the agency decided well we're we're going to see if we can raise money and do something about this. Um, so coupled with the Beaverhead Watershed uh, Group, uh, which is run by a graduate of ours, Jamie Cottom, uh, they uh, started uh, raising money. And boy, they raised money from every little coffer you can imagine to do this work. This was not you know, one big donor coming in or one big slug of federal or state money. It was you know, lots of little teeny pots here and there to put this all together. And then a lot of uh, generous um, free work from some of the folks that, uh, the folks that did this excavation work, uh, as well as the engineer uh, out of Bozeman Confluence Incorporated. So, uh, their goals were, of course, to improve the adult fish habitat. Um, they were seeing, you know, a, a downgrade in size, so they wanted to increase uh, the size of the fish population, get more adults in there. They wanted to improve the spawning habitat. Browns, of course, uh, brown trout dig reds uh, or little pits in the gravel and sand on the bottom with their tails, and uh, and then those get buried over. They do this in the fall. Um, they spawn typically from October to December. So uh, if the stream is really broad and really shallow and, and filled in with fine grain sediment load, uh, that's not an optimal habitat for those browns to be reproducing in that stream. They obviously, if they can dig a red, uh, with their tails, um, dumping those eggs in that red might very well result in those eggs being oxygen depleted um, and dying because we know that the pore space water, you know, you can smell it. It's anoxic to hypoxic and you're getting sulfur reducing bacteria and it stinks. Make sense? All right. So, uh, they obviously then wanted to improve recreational fishing and uh, try to maintain stream function over time. And so the way that they decided to do this was to do a very heavy-handed channel restoration. I've been working for years in the upper big hole on the fluvial arctic grayling problem, which is a cattle problem. Um, and we've had a light on the land approach. We just fence cattle out and let natural flooding fix the stream um, once we've got the banks anchored and not being hammered by cows. And this thing was a full on bring the equipment in and totally restructure the channel. They literally went in there with a, with a loader and scooped out all of that fine grained sediment that was in Poindexter Slough. They just shut the gate off and put the equipment right in the channel and uh, rebuilt the whole thing. Um, so the plan, the management plan was to narrow it, to put habitat back into it by putting in riffles, runs, pools, and glides. So you can see the pools here in the dark blue, and you can see before it didn't have it. Um, it was broad, shallow, uh, it was a mess. Uh, the other thing that they decided to do was to change the head gate. So the old head gate, which was one of these late 1800s wooden head gates, uh, was uh, not letting much water through. This new head gate allows them to allow enough water through to do a flushing flow. So if habitat can be improved at 200 CFS, they can now do 200 CFS because they have the gate capable of allowing 200 CFS to go down through Point Extra Slough. Okay, are we good? All right, so what do we do? So one of the things that these agencies have a very hard time paying for is assessment. Um, they might go out there and have a couple of channel cross sections that they monitor and that's about it. Well, I've got 15 to 20 slaves, I mean students, um, at my disposal. And so 
we go out there and we do that work for the agencies that they desperately need done but can't afford to do. And of course the goal is simply to let them know what's working, what's not working, and to make recommendations on what they should do. So uh, our assessment plan, we went in and we conducted a baseline study in 2014, which is one of those reports that's going around. And then we would guarantee them that we would stay on monitoring for five years. That was the initial agreement. Um, and initially, uh, as I had been doing with uh, my group, my student groups up on the upper big hole, we looked at stream morphology, the bugs, the macroinvertebrates, uh, the riparian vegetation, and stream habitat, um, basically measuring things like riffles, runs, pools, and glides, and uh, looking at uh, bank stability um, by looking at bank vegetation. This year, we conducted for the first time a flushing flow on Poindexter, so I decided to have a group do a sediment transport survey, uh, looking to see whether that flushing flow actually worked um, and moved sediment through the system or whether it added sediment to the system. And we'll get to the results here soon. So the stream morphology people, they go out, uh, we have two, 22 cross sections uh, across Poindexter Slough along its 4.73 mile length. That's a lot of work. <laughs> 22 cross sections is a lot of work. The consultants do two, typically. Um, two or three uh, over that same. So con the consultant out of Bozeman had a couple of cross sections, but not 22. Um, so we have a very good understanding of the entirety of the stream with these cross sections. Uh, we're, what they're doing is they're surveying them and they're just making cross-sectional profiles to see if the channel profile is changing over time. All right, um, we're doing, whoops, back. We're doing bank erosional hazard index calculations. These are basically uh, a, a tool uh, that I believe um, originates with Dave Rojkin uh, that allows for assessing the susceptibility of banks to erosion. Um, so you look at things like root depth and uh, root density uh, in, in the stability of the banks, um, things of this nature. Uh, we conduct pebble counts, obviously. Uh, the stream sediment is crucial because these fish need gravelly, sandy bottoms to make reds that they can dump their eggs in and will be flushed with well oxygenated water and keep those eggs alive. Um, and uh, we do width depth ratios because the stream was wide and shallow. We don't want that. We want it to be asymmetric with a nice undercut bank and a point bar. Um, and uh, we look at sinuosity. The stream uh, gained sinuosity because they did it mechanically. We do water surface gradient. Uh, that was modified as well a bit. And we do point bar growth monitoring. Most sedimentation occurs on the point bars. That's how the stream operates, right? It cuts on the cut bank and it de deposits on the point bar and it migrates. So we look at uh, point bars to see if they are growing or not because in Poindexter at 80 cubic feet per second of movement of water, you're getting almost no bank erosion on the cut banks, okay? So if the, if the point bars are growing, that indicates sedimentation is occurring, and that's not good, okay? So keep all that in mind as we get to the results. So the outcomes of the stream morphology survey, you can just see it for yourselves in the picture. Here's Point Extra Slough before the reclamation work. Here it is after. It's incredibly smaller, narrower, and it's deep. Uh, there, I had a student in the class that was 6'7", and uh, he was trying to measure the depth of a pool um, in this one spot. And he kept leaning out, and I kept telling him, that's a deep pool. Um, you better not get out there any further. And sure enough, he went one step too far and underneath he went, I mean, he disappeared, um, gone into that pool. Uh, but uh, he swam out of it 
and uh, he swam himself back up there and he got the rod down on the bottom. He was hell bent on getting a depth. And that pool was over 10 feet deep. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing uh, depth on a pool for, uh, whoops, for a stream that's so narrow. Now, again, all this is mechanically done. Um, so we got insta improvement um, on Poindexter Slough as a result of this just being mechanically rebuilt. So they changed what was uh, the wrong stream type for those that know the Rajkin stream classification system. Uh, it, this is the wrong stream type for this very low gradient in the Beaverhead Valley. Uh, C4 stream is what it needed to be. They achieved that. Um, they reduced the channel width depth ratios. Uh, they improved the channel asymmetry and sinuosity. They improved bed morphology, meaning that they added riffles and pools. So they built, you know, the bottom of the stream is like a sine curve, right? It, it is riffles, runs, pools, glides. Riffles, runs, pool, glides. Riffle, run, pool, glide. Before, it was just all riffle. <laughs> Mucky riffle with almost no bed morphology at all. And so they built all that in and they really dramatically changed the morphology. You can see it in the cross sections. Here's a before and you can see it's wide and it's shallow. Here's an after and you can see that it is narrow and it's deep. So the restoration work did exactly what they wanted it to do. Narrow it, deepen it. Okay. That's the same cross section. Yeah, but what was the spacing in between? Because like, this is like measuring across, like you do like flow rate down a stream. Right? Yeah. Is that what we're looking at? Right? Yeah, so the stream cross sections, uh, let's see if I can get back. So the stream cross sections look like this. Right. We lay a tape across that, right. the question you're asking me. So how, how far apart were it with each measurement across the stream? Oh, I see what you're asking me. Let's go back to those cross sections. Um, we're typically doing them in uh, uh, 10, centimeter, 10 centimeter increments across the stream. Yeah, and we tighten it up when you're going up the, uh, up the banks. Okay. And then we might spread it out a little bit once you're up on the floodplain, <laughs> uh, but not much. You know, typically 10 centimeter interval is what I have them do. All right. Um, and then they got rid of all that fine grain sediment, as I mentioned. And uh, so anything that was in there, you know, you know basically below sand size, uh, that was mucked out, no pun intended. And so they uh, increased the bed grain size. And they were able to do this because it was, there was gravel all over the place on this floodplain from the meandering of the Beaverhead River over time back and forth. So there was gravel everywhere. They just rebuilt the whole thing using gravel on site. So they actually made a couple of ponds, uh, which are beneficial, uh, and uh, a variety of other structures that um, were uh, borrow pits for the gravel that they used to make, to make this happen. All right, uh, the bugs. So uh, being a trilobite extinction guy uh, way back when, um, bugs are no different than trilobites. Trilobites are bugs. Um, so I got, when I started working on this stuff, I thought, well, I can do, I can do a systematics for bugs. I can do one for uh, fossils. And so, uh, you know, how hard can it be to identify these bugs? Little did I know. Um, there's probably two people in the state of Montana that can identify these bugs down to specific and generic levels. Uh, we get down to the familial level. Uh, with our IDs. I'm pretty proud that we can get down to the familial level <laughs> uh, with these things, but uh, below that you get beyond what the morphology of the bug allows you to ID. Um, and some we can't um, get past the order uh, of the bug. But uh, in any case, it's a great measure of stream health. I mean, that's food for the trout, so uh, we're interested in what the bugs are doing. And so we uh, use a server sampler so we can quantify this. If you've never, how many of you used a server sampler? 
You guys use one? Okay. <laughs> Jack has. Um, <laughs> with Becca, probably, right? So a server sampler is just a net that has a measured area to it that um, allows you to apply some mathematics to the collections. So if you collect in a systematic way from the area, you've got an area that you can then mathematically plug into formulas like the Simpson's similarity index calculation or the Margalev's richness calculation, and you can get a handle on diversity of these bugs. So the old kick netting is bogus. Um, you, you can't get this kind of quantification with the kick netting. You need to have an area that is defined mathematically. So we use the cerebral samplers. Uh, we stick, whoops, keep doing that. We keep to very strict protocols uh, to ensure accurate comparison from year to year. So we time how long we're collecting. We time how long we're picking the bugs out of the pan uh, to put them into the jars. Everything is repeated exactly year after year after year. Okay. You can ask my colleagues I'm anal. Um, <laughs> and the collection work is done anally uh, to make certain that these data can be compared. All right. Um, we started out, um, I had the students collecting bugs from riffles, runs, pools, and glides because I wanted it habitat based. And then what we found was is that we just weren't seeing much difference between riffles, runs, pools, and glides. A little bit. You know, more bugs in the riffles than anywhere else. But not a lot of difference. So um, my daughter, uh, who was doing her seventh grade science project at the time, um, <laughs> got the idea of looking at bugs by the type of sediment that was in the stream instead. And I thought, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to look at the mud versus the gravel. Because if the problem in Poindexter is it's getting loaded up with mud um, from the Beaverhead River, then that's going to affect the bugs, and I want to know that. So that's what we did. We started doing server sampling of the, of the mud and the gravel, and we added in vegetation this year for the first time. Uh, to Because uh, we kept seeing lots of bugs in the vegetation, we thought we should really rake the vegetation and compare that to. All right. Um, we identify them again to the familial level if we can. We calculate percent diversity using Simpson similarity or d diversity index and Margalev's richness index. Uh, these are just calculations that, of diversity. One allows for the whole diversity of the population. The other says, are you sure that that diversity doesn't mean that you have 90 out of 100 are trichoptera, and then all the rest of your diversity is in 10 <laughs> organisms. You follow me? So what's the spread? What's the evenness of that population? That's really important to know. <laughs> so that there's a variety of bugs all at about the same level in terms of numbers. All right, so what were the outcomes on the bugs? Uh, Post-restoration, uh, there was an increase in uh, total numbers and familial diversity and richness uh, that occurred. They recovered really quickly. Um, that in itself, that first year after we did the baseline study and they had done the restoration, um, it was amazing to see how quickly the invertebrates, the macroinvertebrates, returned um, to levels that were slightly better than they were before. Why? There was better habitat. <laughs> there was less mud and more gravel and sand. Okay, um, Vegetation, it looks uh, from our data this year, this pie diagram is from this year, vegetation had the greatest amount of uh, numbers uh, of organisms, but the gravels, which are smaller in total numbers, uh, had the uh, most diversity. Um, and that's been typically been the case. So the, the gravels are really important as a substrate for diversity of uh, macroinvertebrate organisms in these streams. Uh, not that the plants are not important, they are, but uh, the gravels are really important. The fine sediment, they have large numbers of organisms, 
diversity is horrendously bad. So these very fine-grained, mucky, black sediments are full of little red worms, leeches, not much else. Okay, they're bad news. They're bad news. Okay, and there was a flushing flow this year, meaning they ran a couple of hundred CFS down the uh, channel, and we saw a corresponding decrease in both the number and diversity, they're here and here, number and diversity of organisms. Uh, 2017 is in green, 2018 after the flushing flow is in blue, and or purple, whatever that is. And you can see that there was declines. Uh, this is not unusual. Um, when you rake the bottom of the stream with a high flow, um, you end up reducing the numbers of bugs. Uh, we saw this in the upper Big Hole River uh, with natural flooding as well, uh, that numbers would drop the year after a big flood. They come back pretty quickly. All right, riparian vegetation. Um, well, what do I know about riparian vegetation? Absolutely nothing. Um, but you can do a systematics on vegetation. I knew how to do that. And I borrowed a piece of equipment from sedimentology, the meter square, and decided I'm going to quantify these plants um, by taking and counting the plants within a meter square. And we're going to run that meter square along the length of the cross section line from the water line to the pin over here that's holding the stakes that hold the two ends of the cross-section line. So the students will take and start the flip right here, water line, and they'll just flip that meter square over and over and over and over until they end up at the pin. And what they do is they identify the plants in the meter square and uh, they calculate the percentage of each of the plants that they've identified within that meter square. And then they flip it and do it again. And then they collectively use all those data for that cross-section to come up with a pie diagram that shows what plants are in that cross-section and at what percentages with respect to one another. Make sense? Yeah, all right. For the, for the total length of the cross -section. Yep, for the total length of the cross-section. Yeah, gotcha. So these guys have one heck of a tough job. Um, <laughs> plants are not easy to identify, especially that time of the year. And uh, you know they got to sit there for a long time and root through that meter square till they've got identified stuff, and and then they got to try to estimate percentages. So one of the things we found, you can't see it very well, but uh, we added in, we quartered this. this. These are red shoelaces in the meter square that quarter that, and they found that it was a little easier to estimate the quarters and then add up the quarters. <laughs> All right, and then they, they conduct a plant, they put together a plant systematics. And what we're doing is we're just trying to get a handle on uh, what's the restoration doing to the riparian vegetation? Is it improving? Um, is it what we want to see, et cetera? So what did we find? Well, um, we found some interesting things. First of all, uh, of course, the restoration initially increased bare ground, right? They, they dug it out. and. Uh, and then, of course, it increased noxious weeds because they disrupted that ground. And so these are impossible for you to read, but here's bare ground. In red here is um, from, uh, uh, this is, the blue is pre-restoration. The red is the year just after the restoration. So pre-restoration, uh, post, bare ground, way up. Canada thistle, way up. Cheek grass showed up, hound's tongue up. Uh, I can't read that myself what that is. And then the willow went down. Now they planted willow, um, but none of it took uh, that they planted. I don't know why. It all died. I've do we've documented it. It's, uh, it all died. Um, so over time, these numbers have gotten better. Uh, the noxious weeds are starting to get crowded out now. Um, by the uh, diversity of, or of plants that existed on the floodplain before the work was done. And we're seeing all of the noxious weeds decline dramatically as a result. We've done nothing. 
Uh, we've not done spring, we've not done weed pulling, we've done nothing. It's naturally crowding out the invasives, which is great news. Now, is it de you know, devoid of, non of noxious weeds? No. <laughs> There's still plenty of Canada thistle out there, but it is far less than it was, uh, say, four years ago, three years ago. Okay, and then finally, aquatic plants. Isn't this soothing? <laughs> Aquatic plants appear to be rapidly recolonizing the stream substrate, and that's a problem because remember, these aquatic plants were part of the complaint for the fishing experience that people were having on Poindexter, that they were having a hard time fly fishing it because of the aquatic plants. So they're coming back in, maybe beneficial in terms of bug habitat, but it's not beneficial from a fly fishing experience standpoint. <laughs> Make sense? So there's a lot of things to think about with this reclamation work in terms of what you want. What, what are your outcomes that you want? Because you can get a variety of things. <laughs> Some you don't want uh, as a result. So you really have to think through carefully in the management and the planning exactly what it is that you're after. Okay, so stream habitat survey. These people are walking the full length of Poindexter Slough. They're measuring every riffle run, pool, and glide. They're doing the length, widths, and depths of every riffle run, pool, and glide. This is basically unprecedented. Nobody does this because nobody's got 15 to 20 slaves, except for me. Um, so it just doesn't happen. Um, in fact, I ran into a guy once on the Big Hole River from MSU doing a PhD, and he had this piece of equipment that you swam with, and it was calculating, making a map of all the riffles, runs, pools, and glides on the main stem of the Big Hole with this, you know, God knows how expensive this piece of equipment was, and I told him, I said, I hate to tell you this, but I, I, I've got all the data right here. Because <laughs> the students had measured every one. Um, you know, we knew what every riffle, run, pool, and glide looked like. Can I ask a more question? Please. What is it at the line? I know ah. the are, okay, so here it is. Um, so uh, here's the, the riffle, okay, the shallowest part of the stream. Um, the, uh, the run is dropping down into the pool, okay? Then here's the pool, and then it glides out of the pool, back into the next riffle. Riffle, run, pool, glide. Riffle, run, pool, glide. Glide is going the wrong way, dipping, or inclined. Yeah, it's going upstream, correct. It's inclined upstream. So what happens is, is the bugs hang out here in the riffle and the run, and they, the trout hang out here in the pool and wait for bugs to come their way, <laughs> for the most part. There are exceptions, but <laughs> that's kind of how it works. All right, so uh, they also estimate the vegetation along the banks. And uh, the percentage of willow grass and bare ground was estimated for both banks. Uh, averages are compared uh, with that baseline data, and we keep checking it over time. And then in 2018, uh, uh, we were evaluating the flushing flow and whether it changed channel dimensions uh, and banks. So what did we find? Uh, right after the restoration, obviously, Everything had been shortened, narrowed, and deepened because they mechanically rebuilt the stream. So it worked because they engineered it <laughs> and got exactly what they wanted, right? So they hand-built every riffle, run, pool, and glide. It's not like the upper Big Hole River where we're hoping that floods and bank stability are going to naturally rebuild riffles, runs, pools, and glides. They went in and mechanically did this. Um, bare ground, obviously, initially in the banks increased, but within a year the vegetative cover normalized and the banks have remained incredibly stable. This is not grazed. Um, there's an upper area of this that's private. The lower area is public land. The public land is not grazed by cattle or sheep 
by domesticated animals. Uh, the upper area is grazed, but um, the landowner keeps them off the riparian um, up there. So uh, generally, this is not grazed, so that's not a problem. All right, and the flushing flow, what we found out was that it did really not substantively change stream dimensions or bank vegetation. So 213 CFS, which is the maximum flow it got to, uh, did not dramatically change the dimensions of the channel. The ripples, runs, pools, and glides, their lengths, widths, and depths are only slightly altered um, from the flushing flow, but not dramatically. All right, so what about this flushing flow? So the flushing flow uh, was a real big part of the management for the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks folks um, because uh, they were counting on this to maintain this, you know, million plus dollar restoration work that they'd done on Poindexter and that it wouldn't happen all over again. Because remember, Poindexter is getting its water from the beaver head. And for lack of better words, the beaver head is a bloody mess. It gets tons of sediment from Grasshopper Creek, which is a state tragedy um, in stream systems and a place called Clark's Canyon Creek which is a little further upstream towards the dam. Okay, So it's a tailwater outside of a dam, right? It's coming out of Clark Canyon Dam, the Beaverhead River. It's a tailwater. That sucker ought to be clean as a whistle all the way down through. It is not. Why? Clark's Canyon Creek and Grasshopper Creek dump boatloads of sediment into the Beaverhead River. Then there's a dam, again, at Barrett's, where you enter the canyon there and the rocks. And you would think, well, why doesn't it catch all that sediment right there? That should be a sediment catch and the water ought to be coming clear into Point Dexter Slough. Well, the reason is, is because we care more about ditches than we care about streams. So they've got a bucket there and they're mucking the sediment out behind that that's building up behind that dam because they don't want it going into the East Bench Canal when they open the gate and mucking up their canal. But they don't give a rip what goes down the Beaverhead. And I've seen them digging sediment out behind Barrett's Dam and swing the bucket around and dump it into the Beaverhead River to get rid of it. I have video. <laughs> okay, so then it gets to the Beaverhead Gate, and or the Point Dexter Gate, and when they open those gates for the flushing flow, in comes the water, and in comes the sediment. So the plan was that we would do flushing flows when the beaver head reached about 500 CFS. So this is 500 CFS right there. You can see just past CFS 500, that's when Point Dexter was slated to be flushed with 200 CFS of water right here. So that line is Point Dexter at 200 CFS and that is the beaver head right there, the intersect of those two at 500 CFS. So the flushing flow occurred pretty much at that spot in, 20, in the spring of 2018. And uh, it reached a maximum of 213 CFS, which is right here. And then it declined and eventually got back down to the 50 or so CFS that it normally runs at. And that happened over a month. So between March the 15th and May the 14th, uh, they ran this flushing flow with really only a little bit of it running at 213 CFS and then, you know, instantly, right, insta-flood and then declining flow. Everybody with me? Really important to know how this water got in. Now, the goal was to flush the fine grain sediment derived from the Beaverhead River out of the slough. So we go back into the Beaverhead River and we'd run it through that whole 4.7 mile length. 
and Confluence out of Bozeman that did the engineering, they calculated that this would occur at 200 CFS. They were wrong. Okay, so in came the water, in came the sediment. There, the, sed the water looked particularly muddy when this was happening. So the person at FWP who was monitoring this went out with a suspended sediment load sampler and went up on where the water was coming in at the gate and sampled that and went down to where the water was going out back into the Beaverhead River and sampled that and they were the same. And he was like, Whew. what's going in is going out. Wrong. Okay? Suspended load coming in was going out. But what about the bed load? Nobody thought about the bed load. They only thought about the suspended load because that's the chocolate stuff you see when the river's running brown <laughs> with sediment. So I put a group of students on doing a sediment transport survey. And I had a student who had learned how to do sediment mapping in uh, the hydro our hydrologist, Becca Levine. She had had the students, were you in that class, Jack? Um, out in the Centennial Valley doing mapping of Long Creek, I believe, right? Um, sediment mapping on Long Creek. And so we decided let's do Poindexter and see if we can figure out whether sediment's transporting through the system or not during the flushing flow. So it turned out that there are no maps for Poindexter that match Poindexter because Poindexter in 2014 got completely rechanneled. <laughs> so we had no map to work with. There is no map of Poindexter as it is today. Right? So what they did is uh, they, he made it with a GPS unit. <laughs> so he made his own GIS map uh, using the GPS to plot all the banks, plot islands, etc. And he made a base for the stream for three reaches. And then within those reaches, uh, they went through and they used a gravelometer and they did bed sediment mapping, um, looking at gravel sizes, and then they collected fine grain sediments in bags, brought them back to the lab, put them in the oven, cooked them dry, and dry sieved them, and then broke those sieve breakdowns out into cups and did measurements uh, on weight percentage uh, so that we could percentage divide up the fines in there and we would know what grain sizes in the sand size fraction we had. This is something that's rarely done. It's usually just in the gravel through the gravelometer. So, and this was the student's idea. So, they decided actually because of this guy here that we also ought to take a look at aquatic vegetation because that's a concern. So he mapped that too. So he looked at fine grain sediment that was covered with vegetation. He looked at gravel that was covered with vegetation. And he made these maps. These are super cool. So here's the island. You can see the island right here. See this yellow? That's this point right here. Okay. Notice what's not on that surface. What's not on that surface? Vegetation. Vegetation. That was deposited during the flushing flow. It was not there prior to the flushing flow. How do I know that? Because I can see that it wasn't and that it is not vegetated. Okay, so now the question is, is what is it? So we sampled this, dry sieved it, and it's not silt and clay. It is not suspended load deposition. It is sand. It's bed load. It's bed load. This is a, a problem. Then the other problem is, notice that the vegetation is flourishing. The only areas that are not vegetated are in gray. That's what's left of non-vegetated gravel. 
Everything else is completely anchored in with vegetation and covered by vegetation, which I do not think, I'm not a brown trout specialist, but I do not think that that is optimal habitat for digging reds and reproduction. And remember, there was no vegetation on the bottom of this after the restoration was done in 2015. It was devoid of that. So everything you see has grown since 2015. And all that's left are these little patches. And it's filling in with sand as well, which is all this yellow stuff, because they did a flushing flow. So one of the things we had been doing was monitoring point bars. So I had them go out and monitor all the point bars after the flow and to calculate areas that um, had, were not vegetated, meaning they had grown during the flushing flow. And you can see it, lighting's terrible, but see the gravel? Do you guys see the gravel down here? Can you see it? That was the bottom of the stream after the restoration work. See a wall of sand right there going up to here? That's a point bar. That's 20 centimeters of sand. That all deposited during the flushing flow. It's not vegetated. That's not good. This thing's filling up and fast. Look at how much it's narrowed here. <laughs> this is all accreted point bar sediment from the flushing flow. It's not vegetated. It has really narrowed this channel and it's created substrates for vegetative growth. Further evidence, students pointed out, sand that wasn't vegetated was rippled. Ripples mean grains are hopping. Grains that are hopping by definition, bed load transport. <laughs> That's a bed form by definition, bed load. You guys with me? That means that the grain sizes are sand, they are not silt and clay. They're not he missed it in the suspended sediment load uh, evaluation he was doing during the, flow, during the flushing flow. That was not relevant, what was coming in as uh, suspended load and going out as suspended load. Okay, almost done. <laughs> and now we get these little patches of gravel that are left with mostly vegetative cover everywhere. And that's the optimal habitat right there. And there's very, very little of it left. Um, this is a gravelometer survey. This pie diagram here in black shows the amount of fine grain sediments in 2017. Here it is in 2018. That's a big jump. I think it's like a 25% jump in fine grain sediment because of the flushing flow. So, the sieve finds showed, again, that this sediment is sand. It's moving as bed load and it dumped in the stream. And the take home is the flushing flow produced a net gain of sediment in Point Dexter Slough. It did not flush the sediment out. It added sediment. It built the point bars and it built um, uh, little deltaic accumulations into the pools which I can't photograph because they're too deep, <laughs> but you can feel them with the rod. That sediment's building like a delta into the pools and it's all sand because we went down and sampled it. So most of the sediment is moving as bed load and it's filling up the stream. This piece, this photo right here, again, the lighting's t tough, but um, this, these are my footprints in a point bar and this stuff just sucked the shoes right off of your feet. And what's the first thing that the geologists are thinking if your feet are being sucked off, of your shoes are being sucked off of your feet? That that's full of clay, right? There's almost no clay in this. It's all sand. So what's causing the suction? Organics. All the decayed organics from these macrophytes in the river are accumulating with the sand during the flushing flows and they're creating the fine grain component. 
So the fine grain component is not sediment, it's vegetative debris, broken down vegetative debris. That's why it's black, and that's why when you pull your foot out of it, it smells like sulfur. <laughs> and this is exactly where the stream was before they did the restoration. Mucked up, full of stinky muck, and nobody wanted to fish it. <laughs> and it's going exactly right back to where it was. Quickly. Yes? Was before the flushing flow, did these formations exist? Or, or was this a result? Totally the result of flushing flows. <laughs> yep. It, it was the, the material, you know, was it, was it the same, you know, you measure particle sizes. So yep. Was, was it the same before as what you're experiencing now? It sounds like there's more sand now. Than, yeah, so before. before Poindexter was mucked out, it was, it was full of muck, but we didn't look at the muck, so I didn't know that the muck was bed load transport. We only looked at it now, <laughs> and now we can see, oh, it's bed load transport. I assumed that it was probably clay because of the way it felt and the way it, it reacted when you walked through it, but I was wrong. Um, so you suspect it was the same now as it was before? Yeah, because Beaverhead River hasn't changed. It's still receiving huge amounts of sediment from Grasshopper Creek and Clark's Canyon Creek. They're going into Point Dexter, and it's dumping, and it's bed load. <laughs> That's the key. It's bed load. So, and it'll get to the, it's important to the recommendations that we made. So, on to that. One of the things we're trying to do to stop this is to get them to put in a head gate that lowers instead of raises. If it turns out that most of the sediment going into Point Extra Slough is moving on the bottom as bed load, we'll then drop the gate, don't raise the gates. They will not do it. <laughs> they spent 100,000 bucks on that gate. They're not going to change it. And the simple fix is to put in a gate that drops. They make them. I've seen them. <laughs> you can get a gate that drops. They could keep the concrete and the infrastructure. They just have to change the mechanism and drop the gate and allow suspended load sediment to get in to the system because it will get flushed out during flushing flows. But if they let the bed load in, that channel is going to fill in. The pools are going to fill up and it's going to be, well, it'll still stay narrow because they narrow the channel, <laughs> but it's going to be a narrow, flat, shallow channel full of muck. And that muck's going to be sand. That's what's coming. So this is a, the big thing that we're trying to get them to do. They won't do it. Um, so the gate right now has their screw gates. So they've got a, they've got a, you know, a wheel, and, the, and it turns the screw, and the screw lifts the gates up. So when you lift the gates up, the water is going under those gates. Well, that's bed load sediment that it's carrying. Make sense? So the water that's coming into Poindexter Slough is bed load, and it gets into Poindexter, which is running at much lower uh, uh, CFS, cubic feet per second, and it just pfft, dumps it. Because it's going out of the beaver head, which might be at 500 CFS during the flushing flow, it's going into Poindexter at 200 CFS during the flushing flow, and it's like, ah. <laughs> and dumps <laughs> because of the lower flow velocities. Make sense? And that gate's always open when Poindexter's running at 50 to 80 CFS and it's carrying bed load sediment. Right, so how would that new gate work then? So it lowers it into the water? Yeah, you lower it into the water. Let the water go over the top. You protect the bottom so that the sediment can't go into Poindexter and instead we'll go around that cut bank loop on the Beaverhead River and just keep going downstream. Could they not just put boards or something there? Like we talked about that. that yeah. The students were adamant that they changed this gate. This is why we had a three hour argument with <laughs> Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, and uh, we talked about doing that. I mean, that seemed to be simpler than yep. taking that whole thing. Yeah. 
yeah, we're looking for long-term solutions, but you know, they when we when there was a possibility of a short-term solution, we're like, do it, anything to stop sediment flow from coming in to the system. So um, we actually recommended that the flushing flows should be should cease until the bed load input issue can be resolved. They're not going to do that. Um, they absolutely are not going to do that. Uh, so I kind of knew they were going to say that, so I asked the students to think about, um, you know, what could we do otherwise, and monitoring is what we do, so we said so we'll just keep monitoring it and keep giving them the data until they can't take it anymore. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do, <laughs> right? It, it, I have to believe in reason and logic. <laughs> it, it doesn't always happen, does it? Um, but uh, I have to believe. So we're going to keep giving them the data <laughs> and uh, hopefully you know, they'll reach a breaking point and they'll change that bloody gate. Um, so one of the things that some of the students came up with was to build some uh, uh, diversion structures to move the sediment out of the channel and onto the floodplain. I thought this was fairly ingenious. You could go in with a backhoe and dig out some, uh, some side pools to the channel and, and if you put them in the right spots, the bed load will just migrate into those little pools where there's low velocity and pfft, they'll dump and they'll get trapped in there. So you can build sediment traps into the system. And uh, there are some natural ones on Poindexter, but we could build a ton of them. Uh, you know, heck, I could take you know my slave labor and go out there with picks and shovels, and we could build some, uh, you know, to try to trap sediment. So that's a fairly inexpensive way of dealing with the problem as well. Try and trap some of that sediment up high. Those would get filled up real quick. So wouldn't that be kind of just a short-term solution? It is a short-term solution, but what my the goal would be is they'd bedge up, and then we just do do another one. You know, just keep doing them. You know. It'd be a lot easier to replace the gate, <laughs> but they're not there yet. We'll give them time. Um, so um, the other thing that, you know that really needs addressing is the Beaverhead system. You know, Grasshopper Creek, Dozer Dave. Do you guys know Dozer Dave? Yeah, Dozer Dave owns property up there, and he's mucking around and filming it for whatever channel covers Dozer Dave. And that sediment is headed to my Point Extra Slough. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Dozer Dave is down on the grasshopper. Clark's Canyon Creek has a natural problem. That's in Cretaceous, and there's a bunch of landslides in there, but you know, there's beaver in that drainage, and those beaver ponds act as natural sediment traps for a lot of that sediment. So Clark Canyon Creek is a small part of the problem. It's grasshopper. <laughs> grasshopper is a mess from Bannock, well, well above Bannock down. Um, but really from Bannock down, it's a real mess. Friends of ours <laughs> are, are involved, right? I won't use any names. <laughs> Some of our tobacco root friends. Uh, are involved in that mess. Um, so uh, one of the things that we want to do uh, also is uh, uh, look at this in-stream vegetation over time. Robert, you and I talked about this uh, when we were out on the, out on the road. Uh, you know, do we, that in-stream vegetation is going to really change the quality of the fisheries, yet it's natural, it's not an invasive, these are not invasive plants. These are natural plants that, you know, are thriving in an environment that is natural for them. Um, and so the question is, is does their presence indicate health of Poindexter Slough for what it is, or do they need to be removed mechanically by doing a literal in-stream weed pull? <laughs> Right uh, to improve the fishery experience for people. Okay, 
And so we want to conduct surveys, user surveys. We actually were querying people that were out on the SLU while we were doing the work. I made sure the students asked everybody they saw what their fishing experience was like, and they were already expressing problems with the vegetation and the muck. Yes? I don't know. Uh, In other words, is that environment one of the factors that I don't know. Robert's you know much more of an expert on this than I am, but uh, the we do have the fine grain sands are loaded with decayed black organic material from the macrophytes, and as a result, that sand is. You know, I haven't tested oxygen levels, but it's somewhere between anoxic and hypoxic in, in the pore water between the sand grains because it stinks to holy high heaven. Um, and uh, there's very little in terms of bugs. <laughs> and it, so it certainly doesn't promote anything other than little teeny red worms and some leeches. There's almost nothing else that likes it. Um, and start our conversation would be kind of to go down deeper into the level of what kind of macro, uh, macrophytes there were. Mm -hmm. That could be encouraged by all the loads of nitrogen, whatever, yep. but they just are so happy for it. Yep. We have stuff here in Silverbook Creek that is non-native macrophyte. Okay. We probably have some too. We just yeah. did a basic survey this year yeah. or so. And, you know, it might be that it all, it's all native, but I know that these habitats there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Colleen. part of the, the purpose of the flush was also to flush up the plants because yes. those macrophytes can't survive at high flows. Yeah, but they survived 213 CFS. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they thought that narrowing the channel, that 213 CFS in that narrow channel was going to really give it a punch. And it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. You know, the data are what they are. <laughs> you know, I, you know, we, we have it documented. Um, it's filling up with sediment, and uh, that sediment's promoting vegetative growth, and uh, it will eventually become just a narrow stream that is flat bottomed, not a lot of topography on the bottom, and and mucky, just like it was before. It'll just be narrower. <laughs> yes. So trout populations are pretty dynamic, but has FWCP seen any sort of response to some of the variables you've talked about? I mean, has residency declined, or have they seen any fisheries response? Yeah. So uh, Matt told me that uh, they uh, saw an immediate improvement um, in uh, uh, the uh, brown numbers and sizes, and uh, fairly substantive. So, I mean, they're there, right? They're in the Beaverhead River, so uh, there wasn't much time needed. It was just whether they wanted to go in there or not. And I think what was happening prior to the restoration was that little guys were going in there for protection, and the big ones were hanging out in the beef, and they weren't going in there for whatever reason. And uh, now they are going back in there. The question will be whether, as it rapidly vegges up, whether that will still be the case because that vegetation is still growing strong during their during their spawning season, right? Because that's October to December, and although it's waning, it's still there. You know, it's it's not gone. So, that, so there's no fish data post um, flushing flow. Yes, there. I, oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's possible Matt's done something over the last couple months, and I don't know about it. Um, but there hadn't been. The last, when we went in and conducted our survey. He had done it already. Um, and uh, the numbers had improved because of the channel improvements uh, that had been made. And they were almost completely done, right? All that was left was that little teeny tiny section right down there at the confluence. And everything else was done. And uh, those data, the fish data from 2017-18, those data showed an increase in size and number. 
Um, so I don't know what 2018-19, I don't know when Matt conducts those electroshocks. So I don't know. Is Poindexter and FEMA Matt Flood plan to do a conditional letter of I believe that they did. I was not involved in that, but um, I, I've read the report, and my recollection is, is that all, I know it all went through DEQ. I'm sort of curious about how the students responded yeah. to the, to the uh, <clears throat> resistance, shall we say. It was great. I, I make too much of the resistance. Matt did his job, um, which was he went in there and gave those guys a hard time as consultants, because that's what they are, yeah. right? He's not paying them good money, but he might as well be paying them good money, right? They're paying him good money <laughs> to get credits. Um, but the goal was, and we talked about it in advance, I told him, come in there and let him have it. <laughs> Challenge him. And uh, he did. He went in there and he let him have it. And it was great, because they had to think on their feet and defend the data and defend the recommendations that they had made for going forward. And where we got was alternatives to replacing the gate because they weren't going to do that. That was clear. So we had a good discussion about alternatives to replacing the gate. So at the very end, the agency person um, told the students, you know, I, I know it was hard on you, but uh, he pointed out to them that he was doing this on purpose because they were gathering data that he really cares about. This was not a joke. <laughs> and they were rec making recommendations that were challenging management decisions that they had made. So it was really good. It was real. And if it's real, it's good. In my boat, in my, you know, in my book. <laughs> yeah. It's cost. The cost. They spent a hundred grand on that gate, <laughs> and so replacing it, I, you know, I think that's the main thing. There may be other issues. Uh, there may be concerns about sediment backing up against a gate that drops, and then increasing the water flow over the top of that gate as a result, and then as a result, they're losing flow out of the beaver head, putting more into Poindexter. That affects the water that's going into the Dillon Canal through that gate. You know, I think they felt it was harder to control possibly a gate that lowered than a gate that raised. But from a sediment standpoint, raising that gate is causing the problem. So, you know, lots of different reasons why, you know, we're doing what we're doing, right? And so it'll just ultimately boil down to what ends up being the most important thing to them about Poindexter Slough within the management confines, which are that they really can't mess with the water loads that are in the Dillon Canal or in the Beaverhead, other than what they've negotiated. I'm just curious about the history of if this was an abandoned channel, yeah. how did it become such a good fishery? I mean, did they go in there and clean it? They weren't putting that much water down there? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't, the historical information is not, I don't think is that good. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I doubt they did, but <laughs> I don't know. Mike? And, and just kind of following up on Kate's question, what, what made it such a good fishery before if you were getting 4,000 fish per mile? Honestly, I think it, it had a much higher CFS because of return flows from flood irrigation. And when, went they, when they went to pivots, uh, it dropped dramatically and point extra changed dramatically as a result. So we've seen that change over the decade prior to 2014 when the decision was made to do the reclamation. And that decade was that transitional period away from flood uh, irrigation to pivots. Now, I don't, you guys do the hydrology at the Bureau, right? And so I don't know whether, you know, Bill Uthman or somebody was out there and monitored return groundwater flow. Uh, we didn't at Western. Um, so I don't have data that proves unequivocally that return flows diminished when we went away from 
flood irrigation, but I think that logic and reason suggests that that's yeah what happened. I think there's <laughs> a, there was a big beaverhead project, Jeanette Abdo and her group, and yeah, they demonstrated that, that the return flows were diminishing. Diminishing, and also just very important to maintaining the, the flood irrigation yeah. was very important to maintaining. Yeah. If people thought about Poindexter like a spring creek, and it's because it behaved a lot like a spring creek because the groundwater recharge was coming in like springs, and and so it 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 was much like a valley bottom spring creek that we might see in Paradise Valley or in the Madison Valley, um, no different in the Beaverhead. But uh, yeah, when the when it went to pivots, it really reduced the flow. I noticed it because I'd been fishing it since the mid 90s and had noticed the drop in flow without measuring flow. <laughs> yeah. Just anecdotally, too, I, I remember it used to be a lot colder in Point Dexter. I'm yeah. not sure if there's water temperature data that backs that up, but I do anecdotally. It's That's a cooler. Yeah, I don't think there are data to back that up, but I, I don't know that for sure. I'd have to ask Matt um, whether FWP has info on it, but. Um, I'll bet that's true. I mean, it would make sense that that would be the case, right? Because you're losing those colder return flows. Although browns are pretty resilient, um, but it would be interesting to know how it affected rainbows. Because there used to be rainbows in Point Dexter. Yes, another invasive species, you're right. <laughs> so I think we should thank you for that. Yeah. Presentation that right away turned into a conversation. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome.